my motivation here, or my argument today, is that you should really focus on building your skill set rather than just trying to um, finish up tasks or projects like as quickly as possible. I think and An Andrea mentioned about like, um, you know, planning is important, right? And this is kind of a structured way to do that planning. Um, yeah, so kind of just a side note of these of these two skills that I'm going to introduce. They are general skills, um, but because I am an engineer, I will be kind of using examples from engineering. Um, but again, can apply to all of the things that I asked about uh, engineering, um, even uh, engineering design, product management, um, and even when you're in school. So. Yeah, so let's get started with a story. Story time. Um, so I currently work at a startup called Deliver, and uh, we do fulfillment as a service. So you might be wondering, Stephanie, what is fulfillment? Um, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, so when you buy things online, right, that process from when you actually buy an item online to when it gets to your door, that is the process of fulfillment. Um, so what we do is we we try to calculate where the items are located in um, kind of the contiguous United States and figure out the fastest and cheapest way to actually get that to your door. Um, so as you can imagine, um, one thing that's really important to us is kind of this tracking code that comes with your package, right? So you kind of get an order confirmation, you get oh, congratulations, your order is shipped, and then you have this um, maybe like a, di like a long di uh, number or kind of a series of digits and letters. Um, and you can use that to figure out, oh yeah, your package is, I guess I should go this way, shipped, in transit, delivered, right? And for us, for our company, kind of this deliver time is very important because that's what a lot of our metrics are based off of. Um, so, you know, last month my manager came up to me and was like, we're actually not getting these delivered times for um, packages that have been delivered. So in our system, we don't have this time, but if you look up the tracking code, you see that this package was indeed delivered. So that information wasn't getting propagated to our system. Um, so kind of you know, the first inter or reaction that I had to this problem was like, oh man, my manager like told me like this incident and it's probably like really, really big and it's probably a huge issue and kind of I went down this like giant rabbit hole of, oh man, this is like a giant issue, like that means our infrastructure is failing, like I need to uh, redesign the infrastructure, that's gonna take weeks and like I started panicking, right? and. Kind of, I took a step back and I decided to define the problem. Everyone say it with me. Define the problem. Oh man, that was terrible. Okay, one more time. Define the problem. Okay, I think I heard some of you. Okay, I love, again, love audience participation. So, um, so going back to my story. Um, so I took a step back, I asked myself, what is the problem that I'm trying to solve, right? Um, and I kind of questioned my initial impression of the problem, which is all delivery time updates are failing to propagate into our systems. And I was, I first questioned that, right? Like, can I verify that this is actually the case? Um, so, you know, it takes just like a few minutes you know, write some SQL to kind of search the database. And um, I found out that, oh, actually, the orders that are affected, that's like only less than like 1% of orders are actually affected by this issue. Um, and not really like maybe the 75 plus percent that I thought. Um, so kind of really asking um, what the problem was, I really pinpointed the actual issue. Um, and from there, I could create kind of a more focused and lightweight solution to the problem. So that example had a lot of stuff. Let me kind of break it down for you. Steps. 
Uh, first step is don't rush into solving the problem like I did, right? Um, because oftentimes what differentiates kind of less experienced people with more experienced people is that more experienced people will take the time to make sure that they're solving the right problem. Um, oftentimes, like some t uh, less experienced people will fix the problem that is right in front of them, but they won't realize that this problem is actually tangential to the actual problem or is a side effect of this bigger like root issue, right? And you should spend the time actually solving this bigger, bigger issue. Um, next, assess the problem. So what do you actually know about the problem? In my case, I only knew that delivery time updates weren't propagating to our system. Um, so after that, I want to gather information to understand the problem space. Um, can I verify that my assumption is true here? And in order to gather information, I basically searched the database and figured out, okay, what is the actual impact of, of this issue? And then with this new information, I reassess the problem. Um, so it became much smaller. It turned out it was like a very specific issue dealing with like a certain type of tracking code. Okay, steps. And now let's talk about the benefits, which we, we touch lightly on. Uh, first benefit is that it saves on execution time because you solve the right problem the first time. I don't know how many times I've seen someone get really excited about kind of like a project or a feature or a task, and then they kind of spent all this time, weeks and weeks of work, and it's like ready to be reviewed and tested, um, and we, fi we find out that, oh, okay, this is not actually the solution to the problem you're solving. So a different problem, right? And then they have to start all over again, which really sucks, right? No one wants to do that. Um, and then the second benefit is you can get alignment on the problem. Not all problems are presented in a very structured way to you, right? Sometimes people will raise issues or raise tickets where they actually don't really know what the problem is. Um, so it's your job to make sure that what you think the problem is is also what maybe your tech lead thinks the problem is or your engineering manager thinks the problem is, right? So, benefits. Okay, what skill did we just learn? Define the problem, okay. I'm just gonna talk by myself, that's fine. Um, okay, so we've learned how to define the problem. Um, and I'm gonna go into one more story before uh, I present the second skill. And um, so at Dropbox, uh, I worked on something called user data migration. Again, these like kind of weird like titles of projects. Yeah, so what is user data migration? Uh, basically, it means that um, when a user joins or leaves a team, and a team being like a group of users, um, some content needs to move with them. Um, obviously, there are a bunch of restrictions and st stuff like that. So, concrete example is that when I leave Dropbox, right, which I did, um, I should no longer have access to any of the content um, that belongs to Dropbox, such as secret IPO plans. So, um, yeah, so kind of the, the project that was given to me was my manager, um, different manager, but uh, my manager was like, hey Steph, like, uh, there's something weird going on with user data migration. We like don't really know what it is, but you should figure it out and make sure that we're doing the right thing. And I was like, that's it? Like, you know, you have any more kind of structure or, um, you know, like leeway and stuff like that. And he's like, no, like I started like six months ago. So I have like no idea. So I was like, oh, okay, okay. Like, how do I even approach this? Um, so 
first kind of I define the problem, um, which is that uh, we have kind of two concepts, users and teams, and we don't quite know how they interact, right? Um, so kind of the first problem is that there's no clarity on the interaction between users and teams. Um, and the second problem is that the system that is built might not actually do what we think it does. Um, so first, I had to figure out how does, or what, what is it supposed to do, basically? What do these interactions look like? Um, and this is a really large, complex surface area. Like, users and teams have been uh, concepts at Dropbox since like the beginning of Dropbox, right? That's like 10 plus years of legacy behavior. Um, and this project is very big, complex, as well as has a very low margin for error. Um, if I do my, if I accidentally don't migrate your data, it looks like you lost your data, right? Data loss is not good. And then if I accidentally do migrate your data when I'm not supposed to, it looks like a security breach. Also not good, right? Um, so I had to have like a structured way to really understand the behavior of the system. And that brings me to my second skill, which is create acceptance criteria. Um, Acceptance criteria is what it sounds like, a uh, criteria that needs to be met in order to be accepted into the system. Or kind of said another way is that uh, what is the criteria, or like what does the end state of the project look like? So once you finish your project, right, I know that's like, you haven't even like thought about like how to implement it and stuff like that, but uh, once you've kind of determined that ideal end state, like what does that actually look like? Um, so yeah, so how do you actually go about creating acceptance criteria? Um, I, use, I like to use something called uh, use cases. And what's a use case? Um, so a use case is, I know, so much like talking to myself. Um, use cases is basically um, just like a list of events or actions um, between an actor and a system. So an actor can be a user, a different component of the system, a whole different system. Um, but what a use case is, is like it's trying to understand the different, how different uh, concepts interact with each other. So an example is, let's say, um, so let's say I have a user, a user is not on a team, and a user creates content right, and a user joins a team, and then the user can access the content that they created. So that is an example use case. It's very high level. It doesn't mention anything about like lower level details about like, you know, the user clicks this button or this is how the data is represented in, um, in the database. Uh, so kind of going back to the story, uh, what I did was I created a bunch of use cases at the high level, right? I collected use cases from different engineers, different product managers, some managers, in order to kind of get this complete picture of what does this system, what is this supposed, or what is this system supposed to look like and what is it supposed to do? Um, and then once I assembled this giant, I guess, uh, set of use cases, I actually went to different uh, managers, uh, product managers, engineers to get alignment and get feedback on the use cases, right? So I wanted to make sure that I wasn't missing anything and I wasn't misrepresenting any behavior. So once I got alignment on the use cases, what I did was I looked at the use cases and tried to kind of consolidate uh, behavior. So let's say I have like a list of use cases over here and like these three kind of like steps look like these three kind of steps. So I consolidated that into one behavior. And then these three steps look like these three steps. So I consolidated that into like another behavior. And in the end, I, I did this recursively and I came up with 
two types of migrations, right? So from maybe like 25 use cases, I came up with two general behaviors. And, um, and with those general behaviors, uh, I could map out the interactions between a user and a team using those behaviors. So what is an ex uh, example of acceptance criteria? Um, it'd be like, for example, when a, user or when a user joins a team, it's a um, non-restrictive migration. If a user leaves a specific type of team, it's a like uh, restrictive migration. Um, so yeah, so that's my story. Super exciting, I know. Okay, um, yeah, so let's recap. Steps. Define the problem. Okay, no one saw that with me, that's fine. Um, define use cases at varying levels. So I had the high level use cases, right, in my, in my story, but what I did was I did it at every, pretty much every level. Um, so what do the user flows look like? And then well, how do the system interacts, interactions look like? And then within the components, what do those interactions look like? Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, that was what that was. Okay. Uh, review use cases with stakeholders. This is a really important part. Um, if you don't uh, agree with the behavior, like it should be um, kind of stomped out at this step. Um, and then once you have alignment on the use cases, you can generalize the behavior. So in my case, I came up with two types of migrations, restrictive and non-restrictive. Um, and then, uh, I created acceptance criteria for the ideal end state using that uh, generalized behavior. Okay. Um, okay, what skill did we just learn? Create acceptance criteria. Okay, one more time. I want, I want to try to get everyone to say at least one word. Okay, ready? Create acceptance criteria. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, Okay, um, benefits. Helps piece together the overall behavior. So in my case, I have a, like a very complex system um, and because I use use cases and acceptance criteria, I really under deeply understood the system. Um, and I was really confident to make changes because I knew that, because I knew what the behavior was, um, I wouldn't be afraid to kind of break things. Next one, uncover edge cases or failure modes. I think this is one of the things that a lot of software um, engineers uh, fail to address, which is like your software is going to fail in some way. And use cases are a really good way to kind of, um, kind of discover those. So you have a use case, it's like a list of events and, or actions and for each event or action, you can think about like, oh, what, what can go wrong at this step? So this is a good way to do that. Um, makes requirements and behaviors explicit. Um, this helps to gain alignment as well as gives you criteria to actually review and test against, right? Um, if it doesn't meet the acceptance criteria, you didn't solve the problem. Um, and also, it, it can serve as documentation. Um, yeah, acceptance criteria can help gain alignment on the end state, and finally gives visibility on the progress of the project. If you know what the end state is, right, um, and you've solved like, t or you've completed two out of the five acceptance criteria, you still have three to go. I, that doesn't mean it's like 40% done, but gives you some sort of uh, progress bar. Okay. And to summarize, so today we talked about two skills. Um, one was defining the problem, and that defines the current state of the system. And we talked about creating acceptance criteria, which um, kind of describes the ideal end state. So now that you have the beginning and the end, hopefully the stuff in the middle will be a little bit more focused, more structured. Um, so I challenge you in your next project uh, to one, define the problem, make sure you're understanding uh, that you are solving the right thing, 
And the second thing is create acceptance criteria. What does that end state look like? What are you aiming for? And yeah, that's it. So uh, just a quick shout out to um, I'm um, Reflectivity. I'm actually a part-time consultant at Reflectivity. It's a um, Toronto-based startup, and we do skill building. So these are two out of maybe like 11 or 15 skills that we specialize in. Um, and yeah, so if, you, if you'd like to check us out, we're at reflectivity.io. But thanks. Stephanie New. Okay, is there something you don't know how to do? Oh yeah, lots, lots. Um, yeah, so right now I'm working on um, risk management, so how to de-risk projects, um, and that really kind of builds off of the use cases that I presented today. Um, so for each kind of failure mode, um, how do you rank the probability and severity of it, and based on those two dimensions, um, how do you, like, do you actually make a plan to remediate it or just leave it? So that's one of the things that I'm working on, yeah. Okay, you have Stephanie here to uh, address any of your questions. And so, uh, yeah, we still have the mic, so feel free. Oh man, did I scare everyone away? It's like, oh, she made me <laughs> participate. <laughs> uh. We have one here, actually, who's not scared. <laughs> hey, uh, so what do you usually find as the most difficult issue while defining the problem? What's usually the most common? Most the common problem? Most common problem when defining the problem in the beginning of the project. Most common problem at defining the problem? Great question. Oh, wow. Okay. Most common problem at defining the problem. Um, I think it's like when people aren't specific enough about defining the problem. If you're ambiguous about your problem definition, there's a lot of space for error. Um, so even if you, in your head, know what the right problem is, um, if you, like other people, don't exactly have that same view of the problem. So for example, um, everyone imagine a house. And it, do you have a picture in your head? Okay. Do you think my house looks like your house? Mine is bigger. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, your, yours is bigger. Um, yeah, so that's, that applies to ambiguous statements, right? If I'm not specific enough, you don't know what my house looks like and you don't know what my problem looks like. Yeah, so that's, yeah, awesome. Good question, any other questions? What is the most, oh yeah, we have one. Oh. Great, mm -hmm. okay, hello. Um, but what to do if you want to define the, the problem and you don't get enough information, let's say from management or from... For, from yeah, yeah, or, so... Then, then, you know, thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so the question was basically... How would you solve it? <laughs> um, if you don't get enough information from management. Um, so for actually both of these projects, um, I think mo mostly for like the Dropbox one, like. Uh, no one really had the information that I needed and the way that you can approach it is that you can also do use use cases or kind of write out these use cases to define a problem um, because use cases are really there for uh, or I guess in this context you can use them to discover the behavior of the product or the system um, so yeah use, you can use use cases to define the problem and we have time for one more. Okay, what is, oh yeah, we have one. Uh, Stephanie, how long it takes to create uh, acceptance criteria and who signs off? Uh, the question was, how long does it take to take, uh, to create the acceptance criteria? Yeah, and who signs it off? And the what? Sorry. Who signs it off? Or them? Who signs them off? Sign, who signs them off? Okay, gotcha. So, um, how long does it take to um, create the acceptance criteria? I think it really depends on the size of your project or um, the size of your problem. Um, so, yeah. I, 
yeah. I, I think it's like if it's a big problem, it might actually take months, right? Um, if it's a smaller problem, then it could maybe take like, you know, an hour or two, right? Um, who signs them off? Um, it depends. I think like if you come up with the acceptance criteria, right? It's also your responsibility to make sure that you meet your acceptance criteria. Um, so I would put the onus on you rather than someone else. But uh, yeah, you can have like kind of like another um, person check them off too. Yeah. Okay, that was Stephanie New. Thank you.